Hi, welcome to the Listener's Guide. I'm Steve, and in August of 1952, David Tudor was giving a contemporary piano recital, which included a number of new works. Among them was a new piece called 4 Minutes and 33 Seconds by John Cage. To perform the work, Tudor walked out on stage and closed the keyboard lid. He sat in total silence for 4 minutes and 33 seconds, except for the sound of him reopening and closing the piano lid to indicate the breaks in the three-movement work. Almost overnight, this piece became one of the most controversial pieces ever written, because it forced so many people to ask themselves, is this music? Now, this was not the angle that Cage was going for. He said of the performance, they missed the point. There's no such thing as silence. What they thought was silence because they didn't know how to listen was full of accidental sounds. Cage was a Zen Buddhist, and much of his work focused on removing the imposition of the composer from the work and on getting his audience to focus on the world around them in new ways. This was an especially brazen and revolutionary method to do so. By retaining the trappings of performance, but removing the expected sounds, the audience is forced to pay attention to the sounds they would normally tune out, like the shuffling of feet and the crinkling of programs. Regardless of Cage's intent, though, I still think it's worthwhile to ask ourselves if this is music. To start with, let's use a commonly cited definition of music from Edgar Varez, which states that music is organized sound. Normally, composers organize sound by writing down the sounds that they want on the page, and that's about halfway true in this case. Cage writes in three movements of tacit, which just means that the performer is not playing during that time. It just means, hey, Sit this one out, and we'll let you know when you're needed again. But the notated silence in this case is not the sound that Cage had in mind. As he said, he wanted the audience to focus on the accidental sounds of the performance. But in a sense, these sounds are somewhat organized. There's a common pool of sounds because of the nature of the performance. For instance, People wear basically the same kinds of clothes that will make predictable sounds, and since they're humans, you'll hear the sounds of them being alive. The building itself may contribute the sound of air conditioning or of water moving through pipes, and the outside world might throw in some weather, some vehicles, and so on. But even if the sounds are predictable, would you call them organized? And if so, did Cage organize them? And for that matter, does it have to be specifically requested by a composer in the first place? If so, how do we describe improvised solos in jazz, rock, and other traditions? But then again, in this particular case, the performer is making no sound. Tudor was sitting on stage in careful silence so that this event could happen. Does the performer have to make sound for it to be music? I mean, of course not. Classical musicians value silent performers quite highly. We just usually call them conductors. But then, if he's the conductor, who's his ensemble? In a sense, his ensemble could be the audience. Plenty of musical performances involve audience music making, whether it's clapping along at your favorite rock concert or congregational singing in church. Tudor's audience, while unwitting and unsuspecting, did provide the bulk of the sounds for the performance. The question that's much harder for me is one of instrumentation. Tudor was supposedly playing the piano, but to create the sounds that made the piece required him kind of playing the universe? Which is a strike against the idea that he's a conductor, because societal expectations control the audience, but nobody there controls the weather or the taxis that drive by. But that's what you hear when you perform 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Just normal sounds, entirely out of your control, happening more or less at random. The only thing that makes it different from other random noise is that your attention has been directed to it, because it's called 4 minutes and 33 seconds. If I wanted to perform the piece, all I would have to do is say that I'm performing it, and then I would be, and suddenly these random sounds become musical ones. But I won't do that, because I haven't secured the performance rights and that would be copyright infringement. How messed up is that? The only thing that determines a performance of 4 minutes and 33 seconds is calling what you're doing 4 minutes and 33 seconds. Naming the silence literally brings the piece into being, and that's a copyrightable act. So it has all of the elements of music, and none of them. It's deeply profound and horrendously superficial. It's organized, and it's not. 
it's basically music, but divided by zero. Like the whole world just breaks when you think about it. But the reason that it's important is that it reminds me as a music researcher how important a culture's construction of artistic meaning is. The success of this piece depends on our cultural assumptions about what makes music, and it turns those assumptions on their heads and helps the audience recognize and challenge those assumptions. And personally, I think we could use a lot of challenges to our cultural biases in this day and age. Also, just an end note about David Tudor, because I didn't know where else to put this in the video, but he had a lot of these avant-garde works written for him. Lamont Young wrote one where you feed straw to a piano, and the piece ends when the piano has either eaten or refused the straw. There's another one that's just a line of text that says, most of them were very old grasshoppers. Like. What? So hi there, thank you for watching this episode of The Listener's Guide. I am really excited for this new season that I've started, and like I said in the announcement the other day, you can watch the first five episodes if you support us on Patreon right now for only $5 a month. Otherwise, they will be released publicly every other week for the next eight weeks. But if you support us right now, you also get access to exclusive content like The Listener's Guide concert series, where on off weeks, I will be releasing a playlist of music that you can listen to around a certain theme. So for instance, we're starting next week with sex songs about sex. I thought I'd just rip off the band-aid and choose something fun to start with. But if you can't be a patron and you still want to support us, we would still appreciate it if you like us on Facebook or subscribe on YouTube and share these videos with people who you think would find it interesting. So thank you for your support and we will see you in two weeks with the next episode of The Listener's Guide.